The problem I would like to deal with in this hour is interesting as an example of a possible interplay between mathematics and um, computing science, programming as a matter of fact. Um, the history of this problem is interesting in the sense that um, Sylvester conjectured it in uh, 1893. He and his contemporaries could do nothing with it. Uh, it remained dormant until 1933 when Erdős revived interest in the problem and um, some time later uh, a proof was given by T. Galai. I have not seen that proof uh, but it is a proof that uh, even Coxeter describes as rather complicated. And we had to wait until 1948 until M M L or L M. I don't know, I'm not quite sure, so I'll omit it. Until Kelly came I can do it. It is L M. Okay. Until L M Kelly came with um, a palatable proof. Now let me first uh, state the theorem. And that is for any finite number of distinct points in the real Euclidean plane, and with real we mean uh, that the coordinates are not complex, we can assert the following, all the points are collinear or there exists a straight line through exactly two of them. With exactly two I mean not three. Uh, now one of the things uh, that uh, may indicate that the theorem is possibly not completely trivial is that this is not a, a combinatorial theorem. You see, because... Uh, oh yeah, sorry. I, for the sake of brevity, when I now, in, in the, the remaining of this hour, I will say points, I mean distinct points, and when I say line, I mean straight line. Uh, well, the Euclidean axiom that connects points and lines is that any two points determine uniquely, uni un uniquely determine, yeah, uniquely. A line through them, yeah? Sorry. Now let us translate the, t the uh, formulation of all these uh, properties and theorems a little bit. Uh, let us call, uh, let us translate points into persons, lines into clubs. A point lies on the line is the person is a member of the club. In that case, the axiom about club membership is that any two persons uniquely determine the, the club of which they are a member.
That's the translation of this one. However, um, the conjecture of um, Sylvester would be that in a finite population where this club membership rule holds, either all persons are there exists a, either all persons are a member of the same club, or there exists a club with exactly two members. In terms of members and clubs, the theorem is not true. It is not too difficult to construct a counterexample. Uh, place a population of seven, yes, yeah, place a population of seven persons in a regular fashion around a ring. And now I'm, I'm going to create seven clubs of three members. And I do that by putting these three members in one club. The remaining six clubs you get by rotation of that triangle. Any pair of the complete seven graph, the complete seven graph has six time, times, seven times six over two is twenty-one edges. That is, in the complete, in a population of seven persons, you can isolate twenty-one pairs. Each pair uniquely determines the triangle to each edge uniquely determines the triangle to which it belongs. Uh, however, uh, you see that with these seven clubs of three members, it is not true that all persons belong to the same club, because each club has at most three members, and it is not true that there exists a club with exactly two members. So uh, we know from this counterexample that somewhere along the proof we have to use more of Euclidean geometry, more of properties of the Euclidean plane than just that any two points uniquely determine the straight line through them. Now what I propose to do is to approach this problem as a programming exercise. Um, and what I shall do is show that if the given points are not collinear, that then there exists a line through exactly two of those points. And I will show the existence of um, such a line by um, designing an algorithm that computes that line. Um, well, I need one function, no po, and that is short for the number of points on. Yeah? We have one variable Q of type line. I may need a little bit more space. I will develop the program here. Um, we have one variable Q of type line. And what can we do with? We have to initialize that variable. Uh, now, and it's, since lines are determined by two points, uh, my proposal is uh, 
that we initialize, that the program initializes Q such that upon initialization P holds and what will P be? Well, there's no point in considering uh, lines that go through no points or only one point. Uh, so uh, the ver the we shall in initialize Q in such a way that the number of points on Q, no pole, number of points of Q, well ideally of course it's like exactly two, but I cannot guarantee that. It may be larger. But in any case, uh, we can confine our attention to Qs that go through at least two points. So that's being done. Next is the test. We're now going to create a repetition. Uh, whether this Q is acceptable. Well, it is acceptable if the number of points on Q equals 2. However, if that n number is larger than 2, then something has to be done. Well, upon completion of this um, loop, we know P and the falsity of the guard, that is the no po of Q is at most 2. Well, P says that the no po of Q is at least 2, so hence um, the number of points on Q equals 2, and we are done. Uh, well, the only thing, of course, is that uh, here, as a repeatable statement, we have to change Q under invariance of P. So this is the program and uh, it's okay and does the job provided that we can demonstrate that this program terminates. Now, uh, in order to prove termination of this program, we might have to do two things. First of all, uh, we might have to take into account things that we didn't know. Secondly, that we haven't used, that are given but we haven't used yet. Secondly, uh, we um, may have to resolve some of the non-determinism alias vagueness uh, in the statement that changes Q. Uh, one thing that I have omitted to point out, and that is that here we are confining our situation to this case that the points are not collinear, Because that was the circumstance under which we were going to uh, show the, the presence of a line Q so that no power of Q equals 2. The fact that the points are not collinear implies that there are th at least three points and therefore it's possible to initialize Q such that P holds. You see, because uh, to see to it that uh, the initial value of Q is such that at least two points lie at Q. You need at least two points. So here we are. Now, uh, what we have, n we have here made a very meager use of the fact that it is given that the points are not collinear. We have only used the consequence that there are at least two points. Uh, now, Uh, question, what general conclusion can we draw with respect to Q and the points from the fact that the points are not collinear?
Huh? There is a point not on Q. Yes. Uh, so my proposal is to take that into account by introducing a variable of type point variable E will, of type, will be of type point E will also be initialized and the fact that the points are not collinear I can celebrate that by seeing to it that when Q goes through three point to, to, uh, through two points E lies not on Q. I'm going to and uh, the fact that this possibility to assign to the variable E a point that lies not on Q and to maintain that invariance that is the way in which I exploit um, the uh, non-linearity of the given points. Notice that the possibility to assign to E such a value is the only possible conclusion that we can directly draw from the non-linearity. Yeah? That is, the maintenance of this invariant extracts out of the fact that the points are not collinear everything that can be extracted from it. Now, a not surprisingly, in the change of Q, we will have to change E as well. Now, let us inspect a little bit what kind of freedom we have. Well, what do we know? Uh, well, more than two pi points lie on Q. So we can point to at least three points on Q on, that lie on Q. Let us name them A, B, and C lie, sorry, lie on Q and uh, E lies not on Q. Uh, and I will make a picture I promise to you that that will be the only picture I make. Uh, and I wait a little bit. We have to change we have to change Q. Now what possibilities do we have? As it is well I will make two pictures. Q. Okay, uh, here are A, B, and C, and here is E. Yeah. Claim is that we have only three possibilities for the new value of Q. And that's from E through this one, from E to that one, from E to that one. Because these four points are the only points, the existence of which we can guarantee. Now, through, t t through two of those is excluded because then we don't change Q. So Q, the new Q has to go through the old E. And through one of those three. Now, uh, the one it goes th through is, uh, I will call, and now I'll, now I'll rub it out, I will call A. I'm free in the naming here. So the new value of Q becomes uh, the line a. And now I must yeah so uh, now I rub this out again. I'm going to make, make a new picture. This is Q and this is E.
And I've put an A here. And this will be my new Q. Yeah. Now, the existence of E has been used to show the possibility of introducing E and keeping this second term of the invariant invariant. Now we have to think about a termination argument. Now listen, in the original statement of the theorem, we have a finite number of points. This means that uh, our state space that consists of a Q and an E has a finite number of possible values. There's a finite number of values, possible values for Q, and uh, for each value of Q there is a finite possible number of values for E. And it is in this finite space that we have to find a termination argument. How do we find a termination argument? Well, the standard way is that you define an, a natural function on the state space which in each step of the repetition is decreased by at least one. Uh, however, since our space consists of a finite number of states, uh, we can drop the constraint of the, the variant function being integer, it suffices to define an integer value, an integer function of the state of which subsequently we can prove that uh, it's bounded from below and decreases in each step. Now our current state always exists of a line Q and a point E not on that line. Can anybody think of a real function of a point and a line that is bounded from below? The Euclidean distance, yes, thank you very much. So, but if we do take the Euclidean distance, then I know which of the other two, B and C, will be taken as our new E. The choice that minimizes the distance to the new Q as much as possible. So here we put of B and C the nearest to our new Q. And now uh, of the six possibilities that we had here, there are still three left and that is in the choice of capital A. Because the choice of which new point has been settled by this. So now our only obligation is to see to it, to prove, possibly by resolving the remaining uh, non-determinacy, that our algorithm terminates. That is, that the distance from E to Q actually decreases. So here we are, this was our old or old E and this was our old Q and we call this distance H and well B is somewhere the new distance the distance from B to the new Q 
is that, and I call that little b. Uh, and I will do the same for capital C, which has a distance little c to the new q. Only I don't make that drawing because that invokes a case analysis uh, uh, because then there are all sorts of places where C might lie and I'm not going to do that. My proof obligation for determination is that I can demonstrate that the, the minimum of B, little b and little c is actually less than h. And if I can show that, I have satisfied my proof obligation means that the distance from E to Q will actually decrease in each step. Now, I have to show this. I'm going to simplify that. The very first thing is that I wish to eliminate that operator that takes the minimum. So, without changing the value of this Boolean expression, I wish to eliminate the minimum function. Uh, and the minimum of B and C. Less than h is according to the rules of my game that b is less than h or c is less than h. Everybody agrees? Huh? No sir, because in for the termination argument I need actual decrease. So the minimum of these, of, of this, if this value has to be less than h, then b, then is less than, then, then b is less than h or c is less than h. And this is an equivalence because uh, uh, these two Boolean expressions have the same value. Now, uh, The next thing I wish to do is to eliminate the lowercase letters. Obviously. Obviously. Because little b and h and little c, they only occur in that picture. And the sooner I liberate myself from that picture, the better. Now, uh, My claim is that there is a simple expression that has the same value as b less than h. Is anybody willing to make a suggestion? Uh, the length of b of a or b a or a b is is less than uh, e a, yeah, and that fo follows from similar triangles. Yeah. These two triangles are similar because they have both have that right angle there and they share that one, so these two sides, the ratio of them is the same as the ratio of 
the hypotenuse. So BA less than EA is the one. Is that okay? Yeah. Apparently. little bit amazed. Well, according to the rules of the game, uh, the other condition yields me that CA less than EA. Let me check. You check whether I've made an error. Yes. Yes. A A B. You have to show that each time uh, that special function finishes at least for a certain amount. In your case, you have to make this is not. This is the. This does. This does not hold for. Um, uh, because the space is finite. But I did make an error. I did make an error. I did make an error. Yes, yes, yes. There is a one bit rabbit in this proof. And I made the wrong choice. I chose the line, but I shouldn't do that. Here we go. This, by the way, was very instructive, and I leave it that way. But The remark is that I have to choose a new E and let that be A. That is my new E. And now the question is, will the new Q go through B or will it go through C? So my new, my new E becomes A, and my new Q becomes of the lines B, C, and, sorry, of the lines B, E, and C, E, the nearest to A. So, and now I will have P again. Yes. No. 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 One of the three. One of the three. But here is, and now here is our drawing. Here was Q. Here was the old E. Now make the same. Yeah. Here is. My A. Here is, for instance, my B. Now this, now I'm interested in this distance. The distance from A to the new Q. Because this will be my new E. Now, now we have the same picture. We call this B and we call this H, only now it becomes a little bit different here because B less than H is now AB less than BE. C 
similarly, C less than H will be that AC less than CE. So, oops, okay. How am I doing it? Uh, next step. What does this follow from? You will have to derive this. What does this follow from? Now have a look. If X, oh this is very funny. Uh, if X is larger than Y and X prime is larger than Y prime, what are you willing to conclude? In general, X is larger than Y and X prime is larger than Y prime. Can you draw an obvious conclusion from that? Yes, for instance, X plus X primes is large, is, is at least, I can't even put at least here, yes. X plus X prime is at least Y plus Y prime. Monotonicity of the addition. Write now down the contrapositives of this relation. X less than Y or X prime less than Y prime follows from X plus X prime less than Y plus Y prime. And therefore, here you see the form of exactly this relation. And on account of the monotonicity, this follows from AB plus AC is less than BE plus CE. Okay. So far so good. Now, listen. We will, n B and C are distances, so the minimum of them is at least zero. We have to demonstrate that that minimum is less than H. We can never prove that for H is zero. So we have to take into account something some statement of the fact that H differs from zero. Now, H differs from zero tells us because the points A, B and C are all different, H differs from zero tells us that A does not lie on Q. But since E only occurs in connection with B and C, we now characterize Q as the line through B and C. And H differs from zero, we now formulate as triangle EBC is not degenerate. But if triangle, triangle EBC is not degenerate, degenerate, hence BC is actually less than BE plus EC. The triangular inequality, that the sum of two sides is larger than the sum of the, th and then the third side. I don't know. I don't know. It's only the, no. 
I'm looking at this. And on account of monop monopolicity, I conclude that, a, that this follows from AB plus AC is at most BC. Yeah? From monotonicity. From, from this. Huh? Uh, a. Uh, I'm a But for this transformation, replacing this by the smaller BC, I don't need to take A into account. You are rushing ahead. Your conclusion is correct. Again, on account of the triangular inequality, AB plus AC is at least BC. Hence, this is equivalent to AB plus AC equals BC. Yeah? And these are all non-negative, all positive distances. And the only way in which this can be is if A lies between B and C. So we have concluded that uh, it is okay with A between B and C. Of course, this is the only symmetric choice, so it's not surprising. But what is charming is that uh, that fact is forced upon us by the calculation that shows that the minimum of little b and c is less than h. End of proof. Why is this very nice? Uh, You see, if you, if you compare it with um, Kelly's proof, uh, that contains the same element. Uh, Kelly says, well, consider all lines and all possible combinations for Q and E. There's all possible pairs of a line and a point not on that line finite collection, at least one such pair uh, contains the minimum distance. Has that, has, yeah? And then he says, well, okay, uh, suppose that that, of course, Kelly in 1948 proved it by a contradiction, so immediately he says, suppose that uh, uh, there are three points on the, on the line Q, and then he derives a contradiction. We don't need to do that. Uh, now, at the time, uh, Kelly's introduction of uh, the Euclidean distance was greeted as a great invention. Uh, original idea that only a genius can have uh, because of course it is a foreign element because the problem statement itself has nothing to do with Euclidean metric it's uh, the theorem is uh, a fine in invariant so it is a foreign element but we know that given a program uh, with a repetition we know that um, Whereas the invariant of a repetition is uniquely determined by the program itself, uh, the variant function, the decreasing thing that one invents to prove the termination argument, um, that's not determined at all. If you have some function t that decreases, uh, any monotonic function of it will do it as well, of t will do it as well. So we know that if in arguments like that any inventiveness is required, it is at the choice of the variant function. Um, 
Now I have taken extensive experiments with uh, this problem at oral examinations. And I have also shown this a number of times uh, lecturing to an audience. At the critical moment that the Euclidean distance between Q and E has, been in, has to be invented, it has always been the audience that supplied this foreign body to the argument. As so, in short, as soon as you regard this as a programming exercise, Kelly's invention becomes the most natural thing to do. Uh, so there has been progress. Uh, as a final mark of progress, I would like to read to you, because it's a little bit long to write down, Sylvester's original statement of the problem. And that, that will give you uh, another aspect of progress in a century of mathematics. Prove that it is not possible to arrange any finite number of real points so that a right line through every two of them shall pass through a third unless they all lie in the same right line. When I tried to read that, I discovered that I couldn't. There are too many negations and unlesses, etc. And uh, in utter despair, finally, I took uh, the Concise Oxford Dictionary, because I now wanted to know very precisely what unless means. Yeah? Now, I'm a modest man and I'm not afraid of going to the authorities. It was very illuminating, because um, The COD gives two meanings for uh, unless. And the one is if not. Now if is a follows from and not is a negation, this is, this, is, this is or. And the other one it gives is except when. But if you start analyzing what except when means, then you will come to not equivalent. So even the statement of uh, the theorem is already ambiguous. Coxeter makes it worse in the sense that um, he does not give, uh, to begin with, the, def the formulation of um, Sylvester, he gives his own definition, or statement of the theorem, but thereby he drops the requirement that the points are distinct. And then the theorem is false. You see, we can easily construct a counterexample. Okay, that is what I wanted to say about how a once deep theorem these days is a trivial programming exercise. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, do you know about corresponding three-dimensional theorem? Yes, yes. Uh, and that is, uh, that depends on how you, how you uh, generalize distinct points. Uh, one way of defining distinctness in the plane is that any two that uh, any two, that any two points uniquely determine the line through them. Yeah. The generalization for three dimensions is that any three points uniquely determine the plane through them. And then, uh, th what you then can do is uh, take one point, uh, project the other points in the plane, uh, 
prove the theorem in the plane and then restore the lines in the planes again. My guess is that um, Coxeter has missed that, genera that generalization because he never took the trouble of stating explicitly that the point should be distinct. Or he didn't care. I mean, that's the other possibility. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm looking for a conclusion from what you've done, and, and, and I suggest one, and, and that is that um, we observe a theorem which took many years to solve, um, uh, which can be expressed as a fairly simple computer, simple looking computer program. Should I infer from this that actually computer programming really is hard in the mathematical sense to a mathematician? Untrained mathematicians find it very difficult. Um, no, not necessarily. Uh, the program is short. I think the correctness proof simple. Uh, but what is certainly true is that uh, uh, in general a program is a very compact deposit of our intellectual labels. Sure. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. May I propose another candidate to try to apply your method to? Uh, in the 70s, the following cousin of the Sylvester and I. Suppose you have a finite number of points in the plane, not all collinear. Can I put it? Yes. Way? Real Euclidean plane? Yes. Yeah. It's not two in other planes. <laughs> and, and they are colored in two colors, red and blue, yeah. in an arbitrary fashion. Then there is a line which is unicolored, may have more than two points, but they are all either containing more than one point, they are all either red or all either blue. Finite number of points, each point is red or blue, there exists a line uh, that contains more than one point of homogeneous color. Yes, that is how the effect. Uh, by ordinary mathematical methods, it's, it's somewhat harder, the same condition, uh -huh. but harder uh -huh. than the Yeah. Okay. It, it has been done, by the way. It's not an open. It's not. It's not an open. It's a closed problem. Look. Okay. okay. Well, uh, I might try it tonight in bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, thinking horizontally is a nice, nice place. To Any more? No, same argument. Same yeah. You also need the monotonicity argument. Also. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you may not. You you use this step. Yeah. You may use the you may use the uh, implication in the other sense, in which it's very common. It, 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 I, I find there's, there's, there's not another comment, uh, the way in which we have been influenced by our education. Everybody knows the monotonicity of the addition in this form. And it's immediately, if you suggest this, you say, well, what, what can you conclude? People come up with this, with a sum. To do it the other way around, it's just a form that we don't know it. But it's logically equivalent. I find that a little bit frightening. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.